Today, we'll talk about the concepts and configuration of port mirroring on switches, the method of packet capture and packet analysis, and the technical principles and configuration of link aggregation. We'll start with Ethernet port mirroring. Mirroring is sometimes called copying or replication. In earlier courses, we've discussed some of the basic working principles of switches. Let's start by recapping on some of the information we've learned. After receiving a data frame, a switch inspects the header of the frame to learn the source MAC address. The switch then bundles the source MAC address with the port that receives the data frame as an item and adds the item to the MAC table. Then, the switch searches the MAC table based on the destination MAC address in the data frame. If a matching MAC item exists in the MAC table, the switch sends the data frame from the port associated with the item. This behavior is called switching. If no matching item is found, the data frame is flooded. Assume that a matching item exists in the MAC table. If the switch receives a unicast data frame sent from PC1 to PC2, the data flow belonging to the data frame is continuously switched between the two ports without being sent to other ports. Because the data sent between the two PCs is unicast, we cannot connect another PC to the switch to monitor the data. To monitor the traffic sent between PC1 and PC2 on another PC, we can use port mirroring. Port mirroring works by copying data from one port to another. For example, PC1 and PC2 are connected to GE0 slash 0 slash 1 and GE0 slash 0 slash 2 on a switch, respectively. Another PC that runs a packet analysis tool is connected to GE 0 slash 0 slash 3. On a data network, OSPF can run properly between PCs or any datacom devices, such as routers, because the routers can dynamically exchange OSPF data packets. Each field in such a packet has a specific purpose. Standards have been specified for these fields to allow vendors to use OSPF. Port mirroring can be configured to copy the data sent and received on GE0 slash 0 slash 2 to GE0 slash 0 slash 3 so that you can capture packets sent between PC1 and PC2. This is how port mirroring works. Port mirroring is most widely used in troubleshooting. For example, a network interruption may be caused by an infected PC sending abnormal packets. In this case, we can use port mirroring to copy the abnormal packets to another port on the switch and analyze the packets on another PC connected to this port. Port mirroring is also used in traffic monitoring. For example, port mirroring can copy all data on a port connected to the external network to another port connected to an IDS. This allows us to use the IDS to monitor traffic, analyze data, and collect statistics about traffic sent from the internal network to the external network. We classify mirroring into port mirroring and traffic mirroring. In port mirroring, all the data on one port is copied to another port. Port mirroring does not apply to a scenario where information sent from only one device is to be monitored. In this case, use traffic monitoring. Specifically, we use a tool such as ACL to filter traffic as required. There are two port roles that we need to look at in port mirroring. The first role is the observing port. This is the port to which data is copied. The other role is the mirrored port, which can be one or more monitored objects. You can specify whether the incoming or outgoing traffic of the mirrored port is to be mirrored. There are two types of port mirroring. One is local port mirroring, that is, the observing port and mirrored port are on the same switch. The other is remote port mirroring, that is, the observing port and mirrored port are on different switches. 
you can configure remote port mirroring in one of two ways. One way is to perform Layer 2 mirroring. This way requires you to specify a VLAN for remote mirroring and forward the captured packets in the VLAN so that traffic can be sent to the desired monitored port across switches. The other way is to perform Layer 3 mirroring. This way requires you to send the packets obtained through mirroring to the monitored port through a tunnel. In real-world deployment, local port mirroring is more widely used. This course focuses on local port mirroring. This figure illustrates traffic mirroring. The filter in the figure indicates that users can use an ACL to match desired traffic and copy the matched traffic to a specified port. There are two types of traffic mirroring. One is to deliver mirrored traffic to an interface. The other is to send mirrored traffic to the CPU. This slide shows how to configure local port mirroring. The example assumes that a switch is connected to three devices, and R1 and R2 can communicate properly. To monitor the data sent and received by the PC, mirror the traffic between R1 and R2 to GE 0 0 24. So, how do we perform this configuration? We use the first command to specify the observing port which is GE 0 0 24 in this example. Then we specify a mirrored port. Here, we'll take a quick look at packet analysis. A data network carries a variety of data traffic, and so packet analysis can be important in ensuring the correct transmission of data. Protocols can work properly only when packets are exchanged properly. If an error with packet exchange occurs, performing a packet capture is critical to the troubleshooting process and is a must-have skill for datacom engineers. There are multiple packet analysis tools. One such tool is Sniffer, which is both powerful and complex. The most commonly used packet analysis tool is Wireshark, which is easy to use. The figure shows the GUI of Wireshark. In the main window, we can see multiple packets. By clicking a packet, we can find the fields in hexadecimal format corresponding to the packet in the lower window. The packet information includes the source and destination IP addresses and the protocol used. To show more information about the packets, you can expand the fields in the window. Wireshark is used for real-time packet capture and therefore can capture a large number of packets. If you want to capture only specific packets, enter the desired conditions in the filter field. As we have mentioned, Telnet is a remote management tool. It is insecure because it does not use encryption. Therefore, any data, including passwords, sent over a Telnet connection can be captured through mirroring and exposed. Now we'll move on to Ethernet link aggregation. Ethernet link aggregation is widely used in campus networks. Let's start with the technical background of Ethernet link aggregation. In this topology, the link between two core switches is essential. The traffic between the VLANs on the internal network goes through this link. There are two main challenges. The first is on bandwidth. The volume of traffic is too large for the available bandwidth. The second is on redundancy. If the link becomes faulty, the lack of redundancy means that the VLAN traffic is interrupted. To address the bandwidth challenge, we can upgrade 100 Mbps interfaces to 1000 Mbps interfaces. We need to determine whether the upgrade is cost-effective and the switch interfaces are supported. We can also deploy several links between switches. However, this measure is not realistic. This is because loops may exist. When STP is used to prevent loops, a certain interface will be blocked. This interface cannot forward data, meaning that bandwidth is not increased. 
To address the problem, Ethernet link aggregation is introduced. Link aggregation bundle links. After link aggregation is deployed on the two switches, the three links are bundled as a logical link. For example, if each link has 1000 Mbps bandwidth, the total available bandwidth is 3000 Mbps after link aggregation is deployed. Logically, there is only one link and therefore loops do not exist. Link aggregation bundles a group of physical interfaces as one logical interface to increase bandwidth and improve redundancy. By establishing link aggregation between two devices, the effective link bandwidth can be increased and load balancing is implemented, which improves the link usage. Note that the original interface no longer exists after link aggregation is deployed. The original interface is replaced by the ETH trunk logical interface. ETH trunk works in two modes. The first mode is manual load balancing. That is, member interfaces in an aggregation group need to be manual added to the ETH trunk one by one. If the ETH trunk interface works in manual load balancing mode, each member interface can forward traffic. This working mode does not require a protocol. Generally, this working mode is used on a peer device that does not support LACP and both parties do not negotiate. The second mode is static LACP. In this mode, all member interfaces need to be manually added to an ETH trunk and LACP is used to determine active and inactive interfaces. After an ETH trunk is manually created, LACP is then used to negotiate aggregation parameters. In this figure, an ETH trunk is established between two switches and then configured with a static LACP working mode. The LACP mode is also called the M to N mode, where M indicates the number of active links and N indicates the number of inactive links. The M active links in the lag, which is short for link aggregation group, are responsible for forwarding data and performing load balancing. The N inactive links are standby links and do not forward data. If an active link becomes faulty, the system selects the link with the highest priority from the N inactive links. The inactive link becomes active and starts to forward data. In this scenario, we need to determine a master device by system priority. The switch with the highest priority is used to determine active links. Let's move on to the configuration. First, let's look at the configuration of manual load balancing. SW1 and SW2 are interconnected through GE0-0-23 and GE0-0-24. And an ETH trunk is configured to bundle the two links. In this way, users in the same VLAN of the two switches can communicate. Specifically, PC1 and PC3 can communicate, and PC2 and PC4 can communicate. First, configure VLAN on SW1. Then, create an ETH trunk interface and configure it to work in a manual load balancing mode. In this mode, aggregated links forward data. The manual load balancing mode is used by default. After that, Add member interfaces to the ETH trunk. There are two methods available for this configuration. Perform the same configuration on SW2. After the configurations are complete, run the display ETH trunk command to view the ETH trunk status. Now let's focus on the configuration of the static LACP mode. As shown in the following figure, SW1 and SW2 are interconnected through GE0-0-22, GE0-0-23, and GE0-0-24. The three links are bundled as an ETH trunk that works in static LACP mode. SW1 is the actor. In this aggregation link, 
two links are active and one link used for backup is inactive. First, configure SW1. Compared with the previous test, the mode is changed to LACP static and max active link number is configured to specify the number of active links. Then configure the highest priority for SW1. SW2 configuration is also changed, with mode and max link number configured. After the configurations are complete, run the display ETH trunk command to check the ETH trunk status. In this example, we can see the status of ETH trunk 1 on SW1. In the command output, operate status shows that the aggregation interface is in the up state. Because we have configured max active link number 2, there are only two active interfaces among the member interfaces. The two active interfaces forward traffic, and the inactive interface is used for backup. Here, GE0 slash 0 slash 22 and GE0 slash 0 slash 23 are in the select state and therefore active interfaces. GE0 slash 0 slash 24 is in the unselect state and therefore is an inactive interface used for backup. Therefore, SW1 is the actor that determines which interfaces are active and which interfaces are inactive. ETH trunk can be used not only between switches, but also between a switch and a firewall. That's all for today. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.